We start with the second panel, with the second session. It, the topic of the session looks similar because it's almost the same as the first one. But there are small differences which are not very small. The topic of the first session was artificial intelligence and human security in the Black Sea region. And the topic of the second one is artificial intelligence research and communication programs in the Black Sea region. So there are several aspects of this. First, how can we foster research on this topic, on artificial intelligence? Then, how can we introduce this problem, this issue, into our study plans, into our, our problems? And then, how can we use artificial intelligence in our research or education? As I said, we have maybe 15 bachelor programs at top university dedicated to human security and 10 of programs of master programs dedicated to human security. But we have only a few, maybe two or three programs dedicated to artificial intelligence because the topic is new. What we have done in the last years is to establish two centers of excellence and one institute dealing with big data and artificial intelligence. And one of them is developing very good because uh, we put, we managed to convince two Swiss universities uh, to help us, uh, ETH Zurich, Netherlands Zurich, helped us to establish this with a really good uh, world uh, known researchers came to us. And now we have uh, for 11 positions at the students, we have seven public candidates. So we are trying to do this, but on the other side, we are behind. Uh, in introducing artificial intelligence in, into the, the education process. And I guess many colleagues have similar, similar problems. It's every time this way, the universities lay behind the need to melt with the work to develop. So I'm starting with the speeches. The first keynote, keynote speaker, Dr. Glenn, is maybe not still not here because he is in Brussels and I'm in Brazil. No, yeah. Okay, so there is a, a time general. I'm sure he will be able to, to deliver his speech. Buongiorno a tutti. Voglio ringraziare innanzitutto il professor Eden Mamut e la Black Sea University Network per questo importante e gradito invito. Mi spiace non essere lì con voi per seguire i lavori personalmente ma impegni istituzionali mi hanno uh, costretto a rimanere in Italia. Sono Roberto Russo, sono il Presidente della Federazione Internazionale per lo Sviluppo Sostenibile e la Lotta alla Povertà, in sigla FISPMED, fondata nel 2004 a conclusione di un progetto sostenuto dall'Europa e dal Ministero dell'Ambiente italiano, un progetto di cooperazione internazionale. Eh, FISMED è un network che conta oggi 239 partner provenienti da 39 paesi nell'ambito mediterraneo mar nero ma non solo, anche in Europa in America ed è eh, un network che eh, si pone l'obiettivo di eh, contribuire a migliorare la gestione delle acque promuovere l'uso razionale dell'energia e aumentare la diffusione delle energie alternative, quelle da fonti rinnovabili, combattere i cambiamenti climatici e rafforzare la resilienza, sostenere un turismo sostenibile, favorire lo sviluppo agricolo della pesca e dell'acquacoltura, sviluppare comunità urbane sostenibili promuovere l'uso razionale delle risorse marine e costiere nell'ambito di nostro riferimento che ripeto è quello del Mediterraneo Mar Nero che è un bacino eh, che ha forti interdipendenze da un punto di vista socio-economico, da un punto di vista politico, da un punto di vista ambientale e geomorfologico. Nel 2008 FISME decide di costituire uno strumento di lavoro che poi nel tempo si è rivelato molto efficace, che noi chiamiamo Osservatorio Euromediterraneo Mar Nero. E, per legge il Parlamento italiano ci ha affidato un ruolo importante 
eh, nel 2021, dal 2021 in poi, che è eh, l'obiettivo sul quale stiamo sviluppando i rapporti, ancora più i rapporti di partenariato territoriale, e cioè promuovere l'informazione, l'educazione e la partecipazione delle cittadine e dei cittadini alle politiche ambientali e allo sviluppo economico, sostenibile e locale per sostanziare un diretto legame tra istituzione e società civile. Per svolgere al meglio questo obiettivo abbiamo deciso di costituire dei nodi capofila di reti macroregionali che integrano e rafforzano la rete internazionale. Abbiamo scelto di suddividere l'area del Mediterraneo Mar Nero in quattro macro regioni, del Maghreb, del Macresh, del Mediterraneo centrale e del Mar Nero. Nel Mar Nero abbiamo deciso di istituire il nodo in Romania chiedendo al network delle università del Mar Nero di condividere con noi l'obiettivo di gestire questo nodo rumeno da un punto di vista tecnico-scientifico e di gestirlo assieme ad altri partner rumeni nel mondo sociale ed economico. Nei Maghreb abbiamo istituito la sede in Marocco, nel Macresh abbiamo istituito la sede in Libano, in eh, Mediterraneo centrale a Malta e i nodi hanno come obiettivo quello di portare avanti congiuntamente con i partner progetti volti a rafforzare la formazione dei giovani, ad esempio con l'istituzione di una rete di start-up academy campus residenziali per la formazione nell'ambito dell'imprenditoria sostenibile, finalizzata a contribuire alla crescita economica con particolare attenzione alla sostenibilità e alla qualità dello sviluppo. Rafforzare la comunicazione con le istituzioni locali per avviare un dialogo con la società civile per la condivisione di buone pratiche volte a sviluppare e migliorare azioni di crescita economica e culturale, con un forte legame con gli elementi costitutivi dell'identità locale, quali il turismo, l'agricoltura, l'artigianato storico-artistico aumentare sensibilmente la consapevolezza in tema di risorse marine e costiere allo scopo di contribuire alla salvaguardia di questa immensa e sensibile risorsa portando alla luce l'importanza delle attività di blue economy nelle pratiche di sviluppo legate al mare. La collaborazione tra i nodi tuttavia non si limita solo a questo ma è nostra forte volontà quella di supportare le organizzazioni partner che vi pongono in noi fiducia, contribuendo all'implementazione di progetti che, abbiamo, che abbiano una visione comune che vogliano come noi contribuire a realizzare gli obiettivi dell'Agenda 2030, che siano volte allo sviluppo sostenibile e comunitario e che portino avanti valori di storia, cultura, sostenibilità e resistenza. Nell'ambito di questo importante incontro da voi organizzato, che si sta svolgendo in queste ore, anche per il ruolo che la nostra organizzazione svolge in termini di raggiungimento degli obiettivi dell'Agenda 2030, è fondamentale evidenziare una nuova relazione nascente, ovvero quella tra il raggiungimento degli obiettivi di sviluppo e l'applicazione dell'intelligenza artificiale. L'intelligenza artificiale è divenuto uno strumento di risoluzione di problemi legati allo sviluppo e se da una parte gli obiettivi dell'Agenda 2030 rappresentano un passo avanti, dall'altra ci mancano invece indicatori chiari dei costi e degli impatti ambientali, economici e sociali. Questo è ciò che sembra l'intelligenza artificiale possa fornire in questo specifico settore. L'intelligenza artificiale può dare un contributo concreto per raggiungere gli obiettivi di sviluppo, ma anche gestire i rischi ad essa collegati per evitare che l'uso di questo strumento e le sue ripercussioni sui cittadini in termini etici e di diritto possano allontanarci dal raggiungimento degli obiettivi stessi. Per farlo è ovviamente necessario sensibilizzare 
l'uso volto alla trasparenza e alla responsabilità e per massimizzare il contributo positivo dell'intelligenza artificiale. È fondamentale adottare politiche e pratiche che bilancino i benefici con le preoccupazioni ambientali, sociali, sanitarie ed etiche che l'intelligenza artificiale determina. Eventi come questo che aprono tra tutti gli stakeholder delle, della sostenibilità a, su un tema così sensibile e inducono a pensare che la via per un uso intelligente, responsabile e propedeutico di questo strumento sia non solo pensabile ma effettivamente possibile. Ringrazio nuovamente tutti voi per questo spazio che mi è stato offerto e auguro a tutti un buon lavoro e un ottimo risultato conclusivo di questo importante incontro internazionale. Grazie e buonasera. Ok, let us thank the President Russo. Uh, we learned a lot the goals of this organization are and who the partners are around the Mediterranean and environment and the global issues are important part of the important aspect of human security. Let us go to uh, the founder of the Volvic Leadership, Mila Popovic. Good to be here. Thank you very much. And first and foremost, thank you so much for hosting such a wonderful gathering because it is focused on one of the most um, vital and vulnerable intersections in the world. And for that matter, like I said, it's vulnerable, but it holds tremendous potential. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Preda, Dr. Mahmoud, for converging us, because the core of my presentation today indeed is going to be about social cohesion and social convergence that needs to happen. And also, I just want to thank the previous speaker, Dr. Russo, because we are indeed very coherent in what we are sharing today. I really wanted to address today the question of the conscious technology that I will explain why that matters, because we are already been speaking about the importance of developing consciousness and conscientiousness about how we use artificial intelligence, how are we guide um, our human development and planetary uh, direction. And that is absolutely key here to understand what is really at stake in the very moment where we find ourselves on the global scene, what are the global trends? And like I said, what are the vulnerabilities, but also the potential and possibilities of the Black Sea region? As you will see from my associations, um, I am actually a member of the government um, and a currently director general of a new directorate for interculturalism uh, at the Ministry of Human and Minority Rights. And this will play an important part of my presentation because this uh, social innovation and this institutional gov governance uh, in innovation is very important because this is, was one of the responses of Montenegro to those global uh, trends and to those global issues. Um, at the same time, I want to thank you, our president, um, Gary Jacobs, for his um, uh, meta uh, framework that he offered in his presentation, as I am a, a member of the board of um, the World Academy of Art and Science, as well as a member of the Millennium Project, which is the huge, wonderful, very um, advanced think tank of futurists that has nodes in 71 countries. The reason I mention this is because I will use some of the knowledge from the Millennium Project Collective in this presentation. So what I want to point out here, that first and foremost, if we step back for a second and think about the threat of AI, the threat of technology, the threat of existential risks, and everything that has been pressing on humanity on the national, regional, and global basis, we have a chance to develop a rather positive outlook from zooming out on those questions to realize that these very questions have engendered an unprecedented global public conversation. You have seen former and current politicians, presidents and prime ministers of states, business people, scientists, artists, social movements, youth, elders, Everybody's talking about these questions. 
the actual and vital question there is how do we channel that social energy, focus it, and federate the knowledge and unite the human and humanistic collective intelligence to steer the development of technology, the use of a technology and the development of human race. So some of the key questions that are in our public eye and in our public preoccupation globally are the following questions of human rights, human security, sustainable development, and mind you, they are causally interlinked. Then the question of ethical guidance, the right to future, evolution of humanity and the new paradigm, the question of unity and humanity as a living social organism, as well as the question of collective decision-making and governance. These are good questions to have if we can gather to solve them together. Where we find ourselves as humanities, if you will, to use an, an um, a metaphor of antiquity, we find ourselves between Scylla and Charybdis of the convergence of existential risks of which we all spoke, poverty, war, migrations, climate change, violence. And on the other hand, the grand convergence of technologies. And in fact, everything hinges on the quality of human decision to turn the convergence of technology to meet human needs, um, create conditions for the realization of human aspirations. And it all depends on gathering human intelligence and converging together on developing social intelligence and social cohesion. So just to paint quickly the, the scope of the grand convergence of technology, it is not just AI. It is all these other advances that are converging together um, and this is somewhat of a clumsy way of representing this, not terribly clumsy way of representing the scaling of artificial intelligence that I did in two dimension with just um, text to say that we are only at the beginning of artificial intelligence as narrow. We are moving towards general artificial intelligence and possibly into the quantum leap of super intelligence. The threshold um, is at the point when artificial intelligence starts asking its own questions and setting its own goals. That's it, that's the threshold. But with that, we have synthetic biology where we're mixing, fusing and developing um, co uh, 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 compound life forms, mixing life forms, nanotechnology you already know, and cognitive uh, science, a uh, long standing, long established, but longevity science, whereby we have, even within the Millennium Project, we have colleagues that say that, and other um, scientists and innovators and business people uh, who are saying that we will achieve um, immortality by year 2045, which is very soon. But the longevity sciences are multiple, anywhere from cryogenics and cryonics and um, other methodology, but it is the convergence of all of this that is key. So the era of imagining that robots are going to look like this, even with the finest of hair, simulation of emotion in the eyes, this is already past. We are way past this um, possibility. And what, what matters to me here is to see that Sophia, who is the first robot that received a citizenship in a country, and countries are, as you know now, competing for leadership um, in this domain, uh, is able to provoke this human reaction. That is very important. It is able to provoke emotion in humans and the desire of humans to engage it. I want to um, share with you a quote from Ray Kurzweil, who is one of the leaders in um, development of artificial intelligence, particularly uh, the notion of singularity of the su superhuman, whereby there's the merging of the um, human and the ma machine, that is the creation of the so-called cyborg. But it is not going to be, like I said, anything mechanistic. We will have uh, not even a device anymore. We will have an organism the size of one red blood cell uh, that will be placed in um, human body and it will be able to carry the knowledge of the entire civilizational arc of knowledge development and accomplishment. Something to think about. 
So I'm raising the question, what is the content then of that singularity? What does it generate, that kind of superhuman? Who and how creates value? What will constitute wealth, well-being, and wisdom at that time? And it is already here, I can tell you that. Who creates wealth and how it is shared? And what is the value of our being, of our qualia? The very way we, the unique, authentic way in which we experience our individual reality in our microcosm our subjective reality, is the resource of the new economy of immortality, of singularity. And that's the question. Who and how will be harvesting this resource and produce what? I wanted to share with you this information without reading it, that already in 2004, this young man, now an older man, um, 10 years later, we're speaking here, has already, um, he sought eight um, doctors who would install an antenna into his skull. Eight said no, but the ninth, anonymous all, said yes. There will always be the ninth scientist, the ninth businessman, the ninth politician, and the ninth consumer if we continue to use the same mindset. And what will happen then? Then, as you can see, one of the ways to push for the interest of these kinds of new identities is to immediately start as early as 2010 to start foundations for transhumanists. And this is why, to me personally, in the role that I have in the government and in my global work, is to focus on the notion of human rights and the future of human rights. Uh, this is the slide I'm bringing from... Um, from the Millennium Project, and just to share with you to focus on the conscious technologies where the product will be linkages, that is our capacity to develop connection, to expand our impact and influence through connections, to network, to plug into network states. In other words, the quality of our being and the valence that we have to connect as many, with as many people in a quality way as possible. The value and the power will be in the individual, the wealth will be in the being, and as you will see, that the war will be fought over identity, and I think that we already know that we are there. What I would like to draw your attention in an interesting way is that we could read this in backwards, that saying that invented time, which is deeply psychological, will be running our networked states, okay? through unique identity in motion, our virtual, say virtual worlds and aesthetic worlds where the richness of our being is explored in, in the, through the individuality, through and multiply our linkages and our capacity to broadcast our impact and our individuality. So what is then the conscious and the smart environment and the conscious technology? This inbuilt environment whereby say, um, as we usually mention in the Millennium Project, a pair of uh, socks will be measuring your temperature, telling you your blood flow, maybe telling you that you cannot get on the airplane because maybe your temperature is high. Something like that. We usually mention that example. But we are already in the post-information age, in the conscious technology age. My question then, which is a blank slate here intentionally, is then what is... The, in the era of this experiential technology, what kind of experiences do we want to create and towards what goals? This is what we are deciding now together at every gathering uh, that we get to, every time in any organization, at any event, deeply individually and profoundly, exponentially, collectively, we're deciding on this. We're not just asking questions. We have to develop finer questions for our future, granted what we have earlier shared about AI. So what is this singularity? As you see, um, I hope you can see from my screen, we humans are going to start linking with each other and becoming a meta connection. We will all be connected and omnipresent, plugged into a global network that is connected to billions of people and filled with data. That was said in 2009, this dream of singularity is the question, is this truly our ultimate dream of unity realized? Is this truly unleashing of the collective genius for the benefit of all of us? And how will be the minds harvested in that sense to create this, to create this unity? 
I'm just going to quickly share some of the concerns here that I mentioned, but the counterpoint and the counterbalance or balancing force for this grand convergence of technological advances is the social innovation, is the capacity to bond in universal values with consciousness of universal rights for, through an empathetic way into a culture of interbeing, into an, with the consciousness of interculture that is our only saving grace and that is steeped in the consciousness and conscience about the vital interconnectedness of all beings, life forms and phenomena, and the possibility that the technology can give us to have the broadest scale connecting power, but from the deepest scale of personal and social transformation. And for that reason, we are more and more speaking of collectively in many organizations that I work with and collaborate with, we, we are speaking of evolutionary development go goals, where our consciousness and conscience has to evolve and be ahead of the wave of our own intent, um, invention. So the two key resources in the future is and are cultural diversity, because artificial intelligence is, want, is going to want to harvest as many, that is all people, for the variants, for enriching its capacities, it will want to harvest, so to speak, all people. And it will in fact value even more the odd, the motley, <laughs> the, the motley crew of say artists, the unusual identities, the people with disabilities, the marginalized will be now center stage, but we need to be very careful and considerate of how those rights are used or are actually um, used to uh, ennoble our own collective development through empathy and biodiversity that is digitalizing life. It will be a um, key resource. Now, at the center point is where the quality of the human decision lies to develop the culture of interbeing. This is one of the efforts that we did in the uh, country of Montenegro. And why I mentioned that is because very briefly, we are in the Balkans. In fact, Montenegro is the very linchpin in this larger mechanism, if you will, of the Balkans. If you take it out, um, the entire system might, might spin out of control. And we have gotten tired of the term balkanization as it re represents the most regressive, the most backward way of atomizing, um, of, of conflict, violence, atomizing territory. And we, we remind ourselves continually that in the richness and the diversity of our nature and our culture and our people, we belong to each other and all to this planet. There's this motto that we keep repeating that we belong to each other after all the traumas and civil wars, we unavoidably stay together that this marvelous piece of ancient um, uh, land um, and have to turn towards each other with benevolence for coexistence, for solidarity and co-responsibility for shared uh, futures. So um, this is already passed and we counterbalance this with the, um, as Professor Russo was speaking, working with youth, working with youth is key. And Direct Intercultura is an event that we do where we share the creativity of diverse youth from Montenegro every year in September. And in fact, I want to send my regards from all of our youth and from the Directorate of Interculturalism to all of you and broadcast that in, into the world as in a couple of hours, we will have our Direct Intercultura Montenegro 2023. So key, uh, and I will wrap up with, with this, key is information here. The possibility to mobilize 1.8 billion youth holds the key for a sustainable tomorrow. And there has been a study done at the University of Denver by Dr. Erica Chenoweth that said, who studied peaceful movements and said that if in any country through a peaceful movement, 3.5% of its population are mo mobilized, we have the capacity to shift the direction of social development for long-term benefits. This is something that I want to mention 
because in every country in the Black Sea region, this is how we need to think and also unite that way. This is another example. I'll just show you. Uh, this is the Dubai Future Forum and Dubai Museum of Future. You will notice that people on the left are dressed in traditional garb. People and the government of UAE uh, realize that the way to protect the diversity, cultural diversity and authenticity of, of their identity is to be ahead of the futurist way. This is just an impression I wanted to share with you, the biomimicry of technology um, that we experienced at the Dubai Future Forum. But look at what happens. At the end, we sit in a circle in the Mediterranean cultural spirit. This is where the most powerful energy was released. And this is the model of cultural bonding and trust building that we need today. So in closing off, in terms of the Black Sea region, you will see the disparity and the rift and the shift between uh, these two pictures. What it really looks like, um, is it as it is on the left or as it is on the right um, of the screen, um, I am wondering if there's something that we can possibly derive, some understanding that we can der derive out of challenges of the Black Sea region, which is that there is a vital importance and vulnerability of the geostrategic intersection. But there is also the potential to federate knowledge, unite people through their universal needs and aspirations, through social movements, through the outreaches, and through the networks, scientific networks, to actually create a cultural shift that will be the voice of the humanity in the Black Sea region to leverage its geostrategic point and not to be, this is the case with the Montenegro, with the Balkans, and with the Black Sea region, not to be the negotiating chip, but to become the negotiating table for scientific diplomacy, cultural diplomacy.